Today we are going to discuss the second chapter in the book of Hebrews. We will remember that the first chapter dealt with the introduction of the main character of the book of Hebrews, our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the second chapter I have titled, Perfect Through Suffering. So. Before we begin, let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we dare not open your word without your presence. So we pray that you will be with us, with your Holy Spirit, will enlighten us and help us to understand what Paul is trying to tell us. In Jesus' name, Amen. I think this is a fitting title for the second chapter of the book of Hebrews, having introduced in the first chapter Jesus as the Creator, the Savior, the Ruler, God, Yahweh. Now we are looking at this amazing chapter, which is very fitting that it should immediately follow the glory and the magnificence of the introduced God and creator of this universe. Chapter 2 starts with the warning against neglecting salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So why is it so essential that we grasp the veracity of what it says in the book of Hebrews. Because this is the substance of all the shadows. It is an explanation of the entire Old Testament of the Torah, bringing it into the reality, which is Jesus Christ and his salvation. And that's why it's important that we give earnest heed to this issue. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given amongst men, whereby we must be saved. I always remember a situation that I once had in Germany when I quoted this verse and somebody in the audience complained that this was a very arrogant statement because it excluded all the other religious founders on this planet. And uh, I agreed. I said, yes, it is a very arrogant statement for someone to say, I'm the only one and there's no other that can save you. But then I, I suggested that it is only arrogant if, it is not, if it's not true. And I used the example where I said, I am the father of my children. Now, if I worked on the laws of probability, and let's say there are 7 billion people on the planet, and let's assume that 3.5 billion are men, then the probability of me being the father is 1 in 3.5 billion. But those statistics mean nothing if I really am the father of my children. So if Jesus is really what he says he is, then this is not an arrogant statement, just a statement of fact. 
He is the Creator God, and He is the only one that can give life to those that are dead. And therefore, He is the only one that can save us. So neither is there salvation in any other, because there is no other with that capacity. He alone has the capacity. He alone is God. That was the object of the first chapter. And of course, this statement is uh, very much in the firing line when it comes to world religions, because Jesus must be brought down to the level of all the other founders. You may not stick your head up an inch above the rest, because what would that do to the equality? But if this is a fact, then there is no other option. And that is why evangelism is important. You cannot have a situation where you do not state the facts so that people can make informed choices. You haven't got the right to force the choice, but you must have the right to present the choice. In Acts 13 verse 26 it says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever amongst you feareth God, to you the word of this salvation is sent. So this salvation lies in a personage. It is not something I can achieve. A dead man cannot tie his own shoelaces. Somebody must wake him up from the dead in order for him to be enabled to do that. So salvation is a key word in the epistle to Hebrews. We read in chapter 1 verse 14 the terms heirs to salvation. 2 verse 3, so great a salvation. 2 verse 10, captain of salvation. 5 verse 9, eternal salvation. 6 verse 9, things that accompany salvation. 7 verse 25, salvation to the uttermost. 9 verse 28, his appearance the second time without sin unto salvation. Salvation is the theme, but it is centered around a personage. Now if we look at this little word salvation, Salvation is a very broad word, and in context it has different applications. It can mean salvation from the penalty of sin. It can mean salvation from the power of sin, or salvation from our circumstances. Now, depending on how we understand the plan of salvation, uh, people tend to choose some of these options. So some people were, particularly in the times of Jesus, were waiting for salvation from their circumstances. The Jews expected a savior that would release them from the Roman yoke. They were looking for salvation from circumstances. None of them were looking for salvation from the power of sin. Some in Later times, particularly during the Middle Ages, were looking for salvation from the penalty of sin. But that doesn't lead to a changed heart. So there are many aspects around this word salvation that we need to consider. Now we said in the first lecture that we would discuss one chiasm in each of the chapters. There are many, but... Uh, for chapter 2, I chose this particular one. Again, it has a construction, A, B, C, and then the reverse, C with an asterisk, B, A. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them, that heard him. B, for unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. And C, Hebrews 2 verse 9, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 
Hebrews 2.15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And we go to B with an asterisk, B to Hebrews 2 verse 16, For verily he took not him on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And then verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So let's look at the chiastic structure. Neglect so great salvation. What does that mean in this context? So we go to the second A. It means to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. This is the definition that is used here in the book of Hebrews to explain in the broader context the word salvation. So the chiasm explains what is the meaning of the words that are used. The B aspect is, unto angels has he not put in subjection the world to come. And then the second B is, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So in other words, what he's saying here is this issue is dealing with humanity. And he didn't put this world into subjection to angels. He put it into subjection to man. And he did not take the nature of angels. He took the nature of man. And then the center of the chiasm are the two C's. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Man is mortal. And so he became a human being so that he could taste death for every man. Here's an explanation of this word salvation. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So this chiasm focuses on the plan of salvation. If people would study the book of Hebrews, if they would study the chiastic structures, the confusion in the world would not be as great as it is today if they were to accept it. If we take this chiasm and we look at the religious systems within Christianity alone, then we ask ourselves, does the Christian world generally believe that Jesus Christ faced death so that we may live? And the answer is no. The Roman Catholic system does not accept the atonement through the blood of Christ, through his death. They only accept his good works as an appeasement for God. So this very aspect here is ignored by the largest portion of the professed Christian world. Christ came to deliver us not only from death, but also from the fear of death. And this plan of salvation is central to the book of Hebrews. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Protestantism embraced this truth as it is presented in this chiastic structure here. But unfortunately... They have accepted that those that reject it are just as much brothers and sisters in Christ as those who accept it. We cannot have it both ways. Either this is truth or it is error. If it is truth, then it needs to be accepted. In 1 John 2 verse 2, we read these words, And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, this is, this is an astounding verse. And we need to understand the implications. He is the propitiation for our sins. I remember reading that Tyndall was 
wrestling with the translation of this word that he translated propitiation, this hilasterion in the Greek. What does it mean? Because it's very important that he is the propitiation for our sins, but not for ours only, also for the sins of the whole world. No matter what religious system the world embraces, salvation is only in Jesus Christ. And he died not only for the sins of those who embrace Christianity, he died for the sins of the whole world. So where does this lead us? Is it important that we evangelize the world? Isaiah chapter 45 verse 22 says, Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Now we discussed this word God and uh, we looked at the plurality of it, this Elohim, this more than one, let us make man in our image. We looked at that in the first chapter. And it basically says the same. Salvation in none other than in God. And Jesus Christ was fully God. That is where salvation lies. He is the propitiation. He took on him the nature of man so that he could taste death and pay the price that should actually be upon our heads. In Romans chapter 3 from verse 24 it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, the same word, through faith in his blood. And this is a key, a key statement. It is by the blood of the Lamb that we are saved. Roman Catholicism denies this central truth. It is not by the blood, not by the atonement that we are saved, but by the works which are imputed and by our own works. And not only the works of Christ, they say, the works of all the saints contribute to this and add merit to those that lack merit. This is such a misapplication of the word of God. It is a path that leads to perdition. Humanity must study the plan of salvation and nowhere is it clear, more clearly presented than in the book of Hebrews. So Romans, Paul also says that he is a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. So let's look at this word propitiation. Well, let's have a look at the two sources. Here is uh, Charles Ryrie, Basic Theology, Popular Systematic Guide to Understanding Biblical Truth. And he writes, Propitiation means the turning away of wrath by an offering. In relation to soteriology, propitiation means placating or satisfying the wrath of God by the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Again, Catholicism denies this aspect of appeasement of the wrath of God. And some of them go so far as to say, well, if this is the case and God uh, was willing to sacrifice his own son, then we must hate the father but love the son. But they don't understand that they are one in purpose. This is a decision, a mutual decision of the Godhead. This isn't a unilateral declaration. And the father and the son being like-minded, one in purpose, suffered equally at the cross. So if we look at the concordance, propitiation, the word there is hilasterion, a neuter of a derivative, an expiatory place or thing that is concretely an atoning victim 
or specifically, this is very important, the lid of the ark in the temple, the mercy seat, propitiation. So another way to translate this word hilasterion other than propitiation is mercy seat. Now, in Hebrews 9, verse 5, this exact word, hilasterion, is translated as mercy seat. So if we look at the verse, it says, And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So he's talking about the Ark of the Covenant. And above it was the mercy seat, solid gold with a crown around it and the two angels of the covenant standing above it with their wings touching at their top and their face looking down at the mercy seat. Now what does that symbolize? When the angels in reverence and awe with their wings touching, in other words surrounding the mercy seat, looking down on the ark of the covenant but looking at this throne of glory, the mercy seat, and wondering with awe what it represents. So this hilasterion, what does it mean? This atoning sacrifice, this mercy seat. Well, Jesus Christ is God's mercy seat. And this is how he is described in numerous places in the Old Testament as well. So let's just take one example. Micah chapter 7 verse 18. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. This was one of the conflicts that Jesus had with the Pharisees. They were very, very concerned about the shadow and about the form of religion. But they lacked mercy. They showed no mercy. If you take the example that he gave of the Samaritan, the priests and the prelates walked by and had no mercy. And the one who showed mercy was the Samaritan. So he accused the Israelites of that time, of being merciless. But he said, go and study what this means, that God is a God of mercy. In Psalms 80 verse 1, we read, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. So here is a statement that God meets his creation between the cherubim. This is at the mercy seat. Psalms 99 verse 1, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. This is the place where God met the people and where the Shekinah glory came down over the mercy seat. So the mercy seat is very, very central in the whole sanctuary message. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, this is God's throne, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So the mercy seat was above the Ark of the Covenant. In the Ark of the Covenant were the testimony, the stones, the two tablets of stones that were written on by the finger of God, God's law. And the law condemned us to death. And this death decree that went forth from the law was shielded by the mercy seat. What a beautiful picture of Christ and the plan of salvation. If we were to study the book of Hebrews and the plan of salvation as it is explained in the Old Testament and expounded in the book of Hebrews, there would be less confusion amongst humanity. If we continue with the book of Hebrews, verse 2, 
And if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Now, this is a reference to the plan of salvation in the Old Testament. How was it communicated to humanity? And the Bible tells us through angels. Angels were the ones who communicated. If we read the book of Daniel, for example, when there was an issue and Daniel had a vision and he needed to understand it, who was sent to him to explain it to him? An angel. The angel Gabriel, for example. When it was announced that the Messiah was, would come to Mary, who was it that announced it? An angel. So, it was through the angelic activity that the gospel was communicated to humanity. But in the time of Christ, it was God himself who communicated the plan of salvation. So how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? And then was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, namely the disciples. So how do we deal with this? This whole plan of salvation, they were so meticulously given in types and shadows. How do we escape if we neglect it when God himself condescended to confirm it to us in his own person through his own blood? Galatians 3 verse 19 says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. So the plan of salvation had always been communicated to humanity by angels. If we analyze this verse in Galatians, Wherefore then serveth the law? Which law is he talking about here? It was added because of transgression. So the law that he is talking about here, which was added because of transgression, is the ceremonial law. It's the law of types and shadows. How do we know that? Well, because it was added because of transgression. And the Bible says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. So the transgression came before this law was added. So there must have been another law that was transgressed before the second law was added. Now the law that was transgressed was the law of Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not. That law was transgressed and because of that transgression death came into the world. And to solve this issue the law of types and ceremonies was added, pointing to the Savior who would come. And when he finally came and communicated the gospel in person to humanity, not through the mediation of angels, but directly by God himself, then the question needs to be asked, what if we neglect so great a salvation, which was spoken to us by God himself? Isn't this a serious question? So the law was given through angels, but the gospel was given through Christ. So if we look at verse 4 in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, it says, God, also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So who was bearing witness? God was bearing witness. So these are some of my thoughts here. Christians are often under the false impression that they are off the hook when it comes to obedience because they believe that the dispensation of grace has replaced obedience. But if that spoken by angels was steadfast, how much more that spoken by God manifest in the flesh? And then I want to jump a little bit ahead to a couple of verses in chapter 10 
But what did this God, when he came to this earth in the form of humanity, say about the law of Ten Commandments? He said not one jot or one tittle would disappear from the law. It stands forever. Even the ceremonial law. It isn't done away with. It is fulfilled in Christ. It has reached its substance. The type has given way to the substance. So if we jump to Hebrews chapter 10, we read these two verses. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. This is a very, very serious warning. Now, this warning, if we look at it, in terms of exegesis, the context of the time in which it was written, what did it mean? It applies to those of the Jewish faith who neglected this great salvation that came their way and chose to cling to the shadow and the form of religion rather than accepting the substance which was God manifest in the flesh. But if we take it typologically, was there a shift in the Christian experience because the early Christians embraced salvation in Christ through his blood? Was there a shift away from that? Yes. In the Middle Ages, the whole religious system of Jesus Christ was usurped. The priestly ministry of whom he is the sole representative to humanity was replaced by an earthly priesthood. And the blood was taken out. And a sacrifice was introduced, even though one perfect sacrifice had already been introduced. So how much sore punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God? We are treading God underfoot every single day in this world is removed, as we have said, out of, the law, out of the halls of legislature. And within the church, he is sacrificed on a daily basis, even though by one sacrifice he has forever made perfect. Now my question is, can those who believe in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and believe that they are saved by the blood of the Lamb, and they partake in a religious system that denies the veracity thereof? Or sit in ecumenical council with those that deny it? This goes directly against what the Bible is telling us. The more light we have, the more responsibility we have, and the more we must resist evil and bind ourselves to Christ through prayer and the Word. It's no excuse if ministers and church leaders partake in this kind of apostasy against the word of God, we are individually responsible. And the time has come where each and every one of us must make a personal decision and commitment to Christ because nobody is going to help us. Either we are with him or we are not. In Matthew chapter 4, from verse 16 we read, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat, sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I would like to suggest that this needs to be repeated in the time that we are living in. It is time for humanity to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. We cannot afford to neglect so great a salvation. 
He is the founder of salvation. And uh, this heading comes direct from the King James Version. Hebrews 2 verse 5. For unto the angels has he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visiteth him? He's actually quoting the Psalms here. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. It's talking about the whole of humanity. Humanity was made a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honor. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. So humanity was given dominion. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him. In other words, man lost this great opportunity. And they relinquished their dominion and gave it to an enemy. Man was to be God's vice regent and representative. But his crown has been toppled and his honor tarnished. And rebellion and anarchy have the rule. Now, who did this? An enemy has done this. But there's a rescue plan that was put in operation. And this is what the book of Hebrews is all about. It's about the rescue plan. Now, I'm always surprised when people appropriate that which is in the book of Hebrews to themselves and make themselves the rescuer. The rescue plan is centered in Christ and Christ alone. So if we look at verse 9, but we see Jesus, because we do not see humanity in control. It is not in control. The devil is the God of this world, said Jesus. But the real owner who has bought back that which was lost is Jesus Christ. So we're not looking at a humanity that is in a position of dominion. No, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. In other words, he was made human. For the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So here is the solution, the plan of salvation. Why Jesus took on him humanity. So we must behold the man. Echo homo. A rescue operation to restore that which was lost. In 1 John 3 verse 2 we read, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So b dominion again belongs to humanity, but only in Christ, because he is the one that wrested that dominion from Satan and took it back and became man so that he can be the savior of humanity and lift man up from its degradation so that man can become like him. This, in a nutshell, is the plan of salvation. Now, Paul was quoting from Psalms 8, and Paul highlights the noble origin of man made in the image of God. Not lower than the earth, as the earth-centered Gaia worshippers would have it, nor on a level with the beasts, as the evolutionists would have it, but above them all, subject to God alone, in the image of God, male and female, so that they should be one in purpose. He created them as a mini-cosmos of what the rulership of heaven is like. So let us briefly just go to Psalms 8, which Paul has quoted. 
And it says the Psalm of David, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. So first it tells us who God is. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. In other words, out of humanity. And then the strange portion, because of thine enemies. In other words, God created humanity as a solution to the sin problem that had started in heaven. So he created humanity to prove to humanity that the government of heaven is the only feasible form of government. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings has thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou might still the enemy and the avenger, put him to silence. Man is not an afterthought. He had a very noble origin. He was to be the jury that would decide between the great conflicting partners, the great controversy between good and evil. And God knew that things could go wrong. In fact, he knew that they would go wrong. But he had a rescue plan. And that rescue plan, once set in motion and brought to fulfillment, would ensure peace for all eternity. And everybody would have an opportunity to partake of its blessings. So this was not an arbitrary choice. This is not an unfair solution. It is the only solution to the sin problem. Psalms 8 verse 3 says, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, is looking at the magnificence of the universe, the question is asked, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visiteth him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now that word angels there is the word Elohim. And we discussed this in the first chapter, where we showed that this Elohim is plural and it refers to the Godhead. In other words, the Father and the Son were communicating in the creation of this world. So you could basically read this verse also, Thou hast made him a little lower than God himself, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Referring us back to that creation where dominion was given to the world, which was eventually wrested from Adam and taken by the enemy of God. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So this humanity was created a little lower than God and a little lower than the angelic host. It's an interesting statement in the Spirit of Prophecy, Spiritual Gifts, uh, Volume 1, page 69. And it says, those who lived in the days of Noah and Abraham were more like the angels in form, in comeliness and strength. But every generation has been growing weaker. So the original form in which humanity is created, we do not see any longer on our planet. We see a faint faint shadow of what it must have been like. Humanity has deteriorated over the generations. But this creation was so profound and had so much meaning. So the question, what is man that thou art mindful of him, is not that man is unimportant. It is, what is so important about humanity 
that God would condescend to become part of humanity and die for our sins? These are questions we need to understand or try to understand. In fact, it will be the study of eternity. So this question about man is a theme in Scripture that warrants an answer. So if we look up this question, what is man? We see Job in 7 verse 17 asks the question, what is man? That thou shouldst magnify him and that thou shouldst set thine heart upon him. So this is not some worm that we are talking about here. What is it about humanity that is so important to God that he is willing to sacrifice his own life for it? Or Psalms 8 verse 4, which we just read, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visiteth him? Or Psalms 144 verse 3, Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? Or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Hebrews 2 verse 6, which we just studied as well, But one in a certain place testified, What is man? that thou art mindful of him, or the Son of Man, that thou visiteth him. This is, this is the heart of the question. Satan would have us believe that God is a tyrant up there who wants to enforce his will and trample upon our consciences when the exact opposite is the truth. He's the hilasterion, the mercy seat. How did he depict God in the Middle Ages? Through his supposed Christian representatives as this monster tyrant who would throw you into eternal hell and burn you and torture you for all eternity. And even if you were going to go to heaven, he would throw you into purgatory and torture you there until some earthly prelate would release you from that bondage. What a disgusting portrayal of the deity who is called the Hilasterion the mercy seat. Now, the amazing verse in verse 10 has put many people into a tiz. Perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2 verse 10, And it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation Perfect through sufferings. What an amazing verse. Let's, let's look at that in a little bit more detail. It's actually the heading of this entire chapter. For whom are all things? So everything was created for Jesus Christ. By whom are all things? He created everything bringing many sons unto glory through the plan of salvation, to make the captain of their salvation, referring to Jesus Christ, perfect through sufferings. So there are some that say that Jesus had to learn to become perfect, to overcome sin and then be the captain of the salvation. They misunderstand who we are talking about. We're talking about the God of the universe the God of the universe that is perfect. So I want to rephrase that and say, he who was perfect became perfect through suffering. Just mull that one over for a while. He who was perfect, it was God himself, perfect, became perfect through suffering. What does that mean? It means he became the perfect captain to lead the redeemed captives through the valley of suffering to the end of all suffering. In other words, it wasn't a question of him being imperfect and learning to become perfect. No, he was the perfect captain as a consequence of his suffering, not perfect in character because of his suffering that he was already, but he became the perfect leader. 
Wesley writes on Hebrews 2 verse 10, in this verse the apostle expresses in his own words what he expressed before in those of the psalmist. It became him. It was suitable to all his attributes, both to his justice, goodness, wisdom, for whom as their ultimate end, and by whom as their first cause are all things bringing many adopted sons to glory, to this very thing that they are sons and are treated as such to perfect the captain, prince, leader, author of their salvation by his atoning sufferings for them. To perfect or consummate implies the bringing him to a full and glorious end of all his troubles. Hebrews 5 verse 9. This consummation by sufferings intimates the glory of Christ to whom being consummated all things are made subject. The preceding sufferings of these he treats expressly Hebrews 2, 11 to 18. Having before spoken of his glory, both to give an edge to his exhortation and to remove the scandal of sufferings and death, a fuller consideration of both these points he interweaves with the following discourse on his priesthood. But what is here said of our Lord being made perfect through sufferings has no relation to our being saved or sanctified by sufferings. This is a very important point that Wesley makes. Christianity distorted this point and think there is something that they can contribute through their works or through their suffering, to earn salvation. But Wesley makes it quite clear here that he understands that there is nothing that we can add to this perfect salvation. Even he himself was perfect as God and as man before ever he suffered. So Wesley agrees that Jesus Christ was perfect. There wasn't some character defect that he had to overcome through suffering to be made perfect. No, it only enabled him to be the perfect leader. By his sufferings and his life and death, he was made perfect or complete sin offering. But unless we were to be made the same sacrifice and to atone for sin, what is said of him in this respect is as much out of our sphere as his ascension into heaven. Just as little as we can go to heaven as he did, just as little can we contribute to our own salvation. It is his atonement and his spirit carrying on the work of faith with power in our hearts that alone can sanctify us. Various inflictions indeed may be made subservient to this, and so far as they are blessed to the weaning us from sin, and causing our affections to be set on things above, so far they do indirectly help in our sanctification. So Wesley understood that yes, humanity does suffer, and there are many, many grievous things that happen to humanity, but it doesn't contribute to our salvation. It can change us. We can either become better, or we can become bitter. So when we analyze this and we understand what the Bible is telling us, then we must conclude that there is no book like the Bible that can stand the test of sorrow as no other book can. It was born in fire, it soaked in the tears of those who wrote it and those to whom it spoke. Jesus, of whom it testifies, is the king of sorrow and the champion of suffering a suffering that no human pain can emulate. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the one that suffered on behalf of the entire humanity, not only for us, but basically as us, because we were in him as he was reconciling the world to himself. We read in the Spirit of Prophecy, in 3, Spirit of Prophecy, Christ practiced the most rigid self-denial in resisting the manifold temptations of the adversary. 
He conquered Satan in the long fast of the wilderness. And when he came to him as an angel of light, offering the dominions of the world in exchange for his worship, he made sacrifices that will never be required of man. And then this incredible statement, as man can never attain to his exalted character. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't emulate his character. That doesn't mean that we will not grow towards his character for all eternity. But we can never ever attain to it without having to say that we are like God, which is a presumptive statement. So man can never attain to his exalted character, but should climb the ladder and keep on climbing. His whole earthly life was a demonstration of perfect submission to his Father's will. The course of Christ and that of Satan present the complete contrast of the life of an obedient with that of a disloyal son. There's another statement which says, Those who travel in the narrow way are talking of the joy and happiness they will have at the end of the journey. Their countenances are often sad yet often beam with holy, sacred joy. They do not dress like the company in the broad road, nor talk like them, nor act like them. A pattern has been giving them, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, opened the road for them and traveled it himself. That made him the perfect captain, because he wasn't only talking, he was doing. His followers see his footsteps and are comforted and cheered. He went through safely, so can they, if they follow in his footsteps. Now, a suffering Messiah was the very last things the Jews expected. And even his disciples were overwhelmed. But the sufferings of Christ are the proudest boast of the gospel. They didn't expect Jesus to die on a cross. Not so, said Peter, this will not be unto thee. Get ye behind me, Satan. They did not understand. And even after the cross, even after the earthquake, even after the darkening of the sun, they still did not understand. If we go to Luke chapter 24, we read from verse 17, to those two walking on the way to Emmaus. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem? And hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. And then these terrible words, But we trusted that he had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. They didn't understand. They expected a totally different deliverer, redeemer. They wanted to be redeemed from their circumstance and not from their subjection to a world of sin. So if we do not understand the plan of salvation, we will repeat this mistake. In fact, the world today is waiting for this deliverer who will set matters right so that things can go back to normal. They won't go back to normal. This world is going to come to an end. It will have to be destroyed. And only those that have accepted this plan of salvation and, as Paul has said, have not neglected so great a salvation will eventually be part of the kingdom to come. We continue in the book of Hebrews and we go to chapter 4, verse 15. We read, Therefore we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with our feelings of infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He was perfect, 
but he became the perfect captain of our salvation through suffering. Hebrews 7 verse 26 says, And such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. There's no excuse for anyone to say that Jesus had sinful propensities and overcame them and therefore we can be just like him. In him there was no sin. He was holy. He was harmless. He was undefiled. He was separate from sinners. He was made higher than the heavens. Can it be any more clear than that? So if we want to introduce a pharisaical perfectionism into our lives, we miss the point. Salvation is not in what we can do. It is only in what He can do and will do through us if we let Him. So the work of redemption is greater than that of the original creation. The creation speaks of the power, the wisdom, the benevolence, the unsearchable fullness of God, but the redemption speaks of His character his compassion, his unspeakable love, his justice, his mercy, his depth of character that no human mind can fathom but is compelled to admire. He is the only begotten Son that transforms us into the sons and daughters of God. The character of God has always been misrepresented because there is an enemy that loves to misrepresent him. And unfortunately, humanity loves to swallow the tasty morsel that he provides for them. Hebrews 2 verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is an amazing statement in Hebrews. In other words, God is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters in Christ because he's the one that sanctifies us. He's the one who calls us. He's the one who redeemed us and he wants us to be one in him. And he's not ashamed to call us brethren. In fact, he proved that he's not ashamed to call us brethren because he became man. He didn't take upon him the nature of angels. So those that have been redeemed are not released from suffering. So they too must climb the hill of sorrow where their captain leads the way and comforts them on their journey. What true soul has ever followed in his footsteps and has never experienced the contradiction of sinners, the conflict with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even if they are, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees of this this day. Weariness, tears, disappointments, persecutions, even from those who call themselves friends or next of kin. Friendlessness, loneliness, trials, treachery and graves are the lot of the followers of Christ. If Christ had never been tempted, how could he succor those that are tempted? Do we understand this verse? He was made perfect through suffering. He's the perfect captain because he had the perfect suffering. Verse 12 says in Hebrews, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God has given me. He is embracing humanity. He delights in them. He sings. The Bible actually tells us that when we get to heaven, that Jesus will sing. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise to part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is, the devil. If people would understand this plan of salvation, there would be only one religion on this planet. If I can put it this way, people die because they are born. But Christ was born 
that he may die. Did I read that again? People die because they are born. But Christ was born that he may die. He who is eternal clothed himself with humanity so that he could die for humanity. God cannot die. But he clothed himself with humanity so that he could die. By his death he conquered death and him who had power over death. But by his sufferings he became the captain of our salvation. The resurrection sounded the death knell of Satan and sealed his doom and turned him into a roaring lion seeking whom he could devour before his end would come. So the conflict didn't stop with the death of Christ. In fact, it intensified, but the victory had been won. The enemy had been vanquished, but not eliminated. So death, in other words, makes a lot of noise, and Satan uses it to instill the hearts with fear. But fear not the devil nor death, because both have been conquered. We must think about that. Death is the devil's tool to coerce the will, but rather fear God who has conquered death and never coerces the will. Fear is Satan's weapon and destruction his reward. Now, we can put that into a present day con context. Death is Satan's weapon. If you go to the Middle Ages, what did he use as his main weapon? Fear of death, fear of the afterlife, fear of the wrath of God. What happens when you die? You go roast in hell or you go roast in purgatory. And he used this fear to establish his priesthood. It is a, a system based on lies, distorting the character of God. So, Study the history of the priesthood. They crucified Christ in the time of Christ and they turned the focus to themselves. They are so successful because the pulpit has not preached Christ effectively. Priestcraft has darkened the world with crime and saturated the earth with blood. If we think about the Inquisition and the horrors of the persecution that took place, in the Middle Ages and is still taking place to this very day hidden under the garment of secret societies and whatever else they conjure up to persecute God's people. Humanity turns too readily to human aid when one has gone before them and that one is Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate priest that cannot err nor disappoint. How can they die that have already died in Christ? You don't have to fear death if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, if you have not neglected so great a salvation. In Luke chapter 10 verse 19 it says, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And I want you to notice that the emphasis here is on I, not you. Because some people presumptuously claim that they have this power. But it is a power that comes from God alone. However near Christ we may be, it avails nothing if you do not turn to him, but choose to lean on the arm of flesh. Thus said the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Jeremiah 17 verse 5. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 8. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us, and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the word of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, what has that got to do with our time? We're living in terrible times. And humanity is constantly being urged to make flesh their arm. 
to rely on the so-called words of science and politicians that coerce you into performing their will and threaten you, as they did in the Middle Ages. There is no relief from this, and there will be no relief. Was there any relief in the Middle Ages? Did they give freedom of choice to those who decided to follow Christ and to accept the Protestant view that Christ, through his blood, atoned for our sins? No. They murdered them relentlessly. And under different garbs, they are still busy doing exactly the same thing today. We read in the spirit of prophecy, This will be the experience of those who wear Christ's yoke and learn his meekness and lowliness. This is your safety. Lean not on the arm of flesh, for if you do, you will certainly fail to fulfill the commission which God has given you, a commission that he has not withdrawn. Do not allow what men say to lead you to misrepresent your leader. Do not trust in man. God says, let him take hold of my strength, that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. Now is the time when we must trust in this Savior and not neglect so great a salvation. The time is coming when the arm of flesh will be cut off. There will be no human aid. There will be no human balm. The only one who can take us through the times that we are heading for is Jesus Christ. Verse 15 says, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Yes, when we have fear of death, we are subject to bondage, and Satan uses it as a tool. Ask yourself the question, is he using fear in the times that we are living now, fear of death, through disease, through pandemics? Is he leading us in a direction which we might not follow if we didn't have this fear of death. We must trust in the one who has conquered death. And then it says, For verily he took not him the, on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a man. He identified himself with humanity. You can trust him. Unfortunately, the modern translations render this verse in Hebrews chapter 2, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. They miss the entire point. It is such a, a travesty to read a verse with such a translation. For verily he took on, not on him the nature of angels. He became man. He identified himself with humanity so that he could pay the price for humanity. This nonsensical statement down here Surely it is not angels he helps. is not even true. Didn't Michael come to the aid of, of the angel Gabriel when the devil resisted him? Of course. So we must understand what this book is about. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. This is the crux of the matter. That's why I've put it in bold. This is the solution for the sin problem. If we neglect the salvation, we end up on the slippery slope where humanity is walking right now. Hebrews 2 verse 18. For in this he himself has suffered being tempted. He is able to succor them that are tempted. So the burden of Paul in chapter 2 is to show that the captain of our salvation is the perfect one to emulate and he is safe to follow because he didn't look at it from a distance but partook of it in the flesh. If he never wept, how could he quench our tears? The shortest verse in the Bible is found in the Gospel of John and it says, Jesus wept. And I would like to say this verse deserves to stand alone as the shortest verse in the Bible. 
It is a monument to the compassionate Savior. He who has the power to force the will wept because he refused to use that power to coerce the human will, and he shook with sorrow as he watched them tread the path of destruction. He is perfectly adapted to his task. His certificate of authority is signed with blood, and he is the perfect captain to lead us to the land where God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrowing nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Revelation 21 verse 4. My dear brothers and sisters, if we look at chapter 2 and we see in which way Paul portrays the captain of our salvation as perfect, as the perfect captain to lead us through this road. And he being by, the very, by his very nature God could have forced humanity to do his will. He could have coerced humanity like the politicians and the scientists of this world want to do at the current moment. But he didn't. He allowed people to make their choice. And their choice led to destruction. May God give us wisdom as we look at these things. So for this reason, suffering is permitted to befall us in order to qualify us in our small sphere to become comforters to our brethren when they too become victims to suffering or stumble by the wayside. Are we Are going to meet that more and more? Are we going to have the same condemning spirit as the Pharisees had? All who have received the gift of comforting others have in some measure felt the ennobling gift of suffering themselves. So they can be wise counselors, physicians and nurses of the flock. But beware of the root of bitterness that turns us from the school of life to the school of death. Job learnt in the school of sorrow, but many won't learn there. Job said in verse 1 of chapter 10, My soul is weary of my life. I think there are many people in this time that we are living in that say, My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Or verse 25 in chapter 21, And another dieth in the bitterness of his soul and never eateth with pleasure. I think there are many that die in the bitterness of their soul and never eateth with pleasure. Devoid of human comfort. When in the world have we had a situation where those that are dying are not even allowed to be comforted by those that love them? What an amazing world we are in. I wonder who is in control of those matters. Is it the compassionate Savior who became man so that he could identify with us? I don't think so. Suffering educates sympathy. It lightens the tread, enables to read from afar the symptoms of a suffering soul, and to apply the balm of Gilead or the word spoken in season, it shines brightest when the skies are dark. If we do not attune ourselves to the suffering of others and do not emulate this world or lean upon this world, then this world will be a kinder place. If we see people suffering, then alleviate the suffering where it is in your capacity to do so. If you see someone is burdened, then give a word of encouragement. Philippians 3 verse 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. So may God give us wisdom as we consider a suffering Savior who was made perfect through suffering lest we become hard-hearted and join the direction in which this world is going at the moment. Let us consider what Christ went through and what he means to us, and let us not neglect so great a salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this chapter that explains to us 
what Jesus actually means in terms of our salvation. What he did for us and the road he walked in our behalf. We are not following some despot, some deceiver. But we are following the God of the universe who has told us that we can come freely to the mercy seat, the hilasterion, the propitiation. And even though the world rejects it, let us embrace it. In Jesus' name, amen.